There you can click on your state to figure out how it's doing. Click on the 75 most populated cities. And for real fun, you can create your own charts where you can compare the states to each other or the 75 most populated cities and do charts on those. You can also do charts on the federal government. Today's event is based upon a series of articles that we've seen that claim that deficits don't matter. Well, we're here today to report that they do matter. As I mentioned, the true national debt is more than 133 trillion, that's with a T, trillion dollars. When you include unfunded social security and Medicare promises. With spending out of control during this pandemic, things are only getting worse and the burden on taxpayers is growing faster than ever. Today, we are honored to have Paul B. Gazarian join us as our outside expert. He is the founder, chairman, and CEO of Caponica Partners and the Kazarian Center for Public Financial Management. Japonica Partners is a private investment company that has built its track record on creating more than $10 billion in transformative investments with low risk, high returns. In 1998, Paul founded the Charles and Agnes Kazarian Foundation, whose core mission is and competency are to improve public financial management and financial literacy. Joining me and Bill today is our in-house expert, Bill Bergman. Bill is our research director and he delivers our daily morning newsletter morning call. He is a former policy analyst at the Federal Reserve of Chicago and now he teaches finance courses at, the univer at Loyola University. Today, everybody will get a chance to ask questions via our Q&A feature in Zoom. Keep in mind, this isn't the chat feature, it's the Q&A feature. To find that feature, just go to the bottom of your Zoom screen. You'll see from left to right, the mute button, start video, and then there's the Q&A button. Just type in your questions in the box um, at any point during this event and we'll get, we'll get to as many as we can. We're fortunate that today's event will, is sold out, so we thank everybody for joining us. So now what I'll do is I'll turn it over to Paul for, some, for, a, for a few brief questions, and then Bill, and Bill will uh, provide some comments and then ask Paul some questions, and then I'll be back for Q&A um, with your audience questions. <clears throat> Paul, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me express the view of many to thank Truth and Accounting, Sheila Weinberg, Bill Bergman, and their, for their wonderful work to educate and empower citizens with understandable, reliable, and transparent government financial information. They are a voice of reason in a world of financial turmoil. Uh, today's topic for us is a super serious topic. The topic is the destructively toxic government debt and deficit framework. In short abbreviation, the D&D framework. This is the current framework used almost universally to measure government financial performance, financial position, and credit risk. Based on the horrible financial track record and developments in government financial reporting, public financial management, and new sovereign financial technology, the D&D model again, debt and deficit model, should be replaced with the citizen's wealth and total government total net worth framework. But to put my comments uh, in context, the culture of our firm, Japonica Partners, and our foundation, the Kazarian Foundation, is to see what others do not see and to use education, 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 to accomplish what others believe is impossible. As for the debt and deficit framework, simply put, the debt and deficit D&D framework is both chronically flawed and massively value destructive. We say destructively toxic, in part because it enables mismanagement and corruption within a government. 
and point of fact, for massive and highly complex organizations, unlike households and small businesses, the focus on cash-based fiscal balances, i.e. cash deficits, and the nominal value of debt provides vastly more flexibility and indeed incentivizes to create fiscal illusions than they do financial statement numbers in accordance with international accounting standards. The right way forward starts by breaking down the professional niche silos that propagate the D&D framework. Then to synergize the best from each silo within the citizens wealth and government total net worth, we call it the CN and NW um, framework. That's the CW and NW framework based on audited financial statements and the New Zealand public financial model. What is citizens wealth, the CW? It's a per person government performance track record indicator that provides significantly better historical and comparative insights into the relationship between the total economy, GDP, and the government's total balance sheet, especially when compared to GDP, debt, or the debt to GDP ratio. The CW government performance indicator disrupts obsolete and financially destructive conventional thinking, merging two data silos by starting with an annual economic statistic, total economy, gross domestic product, and subtracting a government financial balance sheet number, government total net debts. And for some of you may know, but a lot of you don't, um, at least based on our last seven years involved in the sector, uh, government total net worth is the government's total assets, both financial assets and non-financial assets, less the government's total debts, and that's financial debts and non-financial debts. And for us, it's, it, it, it's very important to use the audited financial statements as the bedrock for comparison, both historically and with among peer countries. Um, net worth used when total government assets exceed total government debts. When total government debts exceed total government assets, we often use the term total government net burden or total government net debts because we find it very helpful in communicating the financial burden placed on citizens. The financial burden is often more easily understood than a negative net worth and more compatible with KPIs such as our multiplier or inverse multiplier. Um, in fact, few governments have positive total net worth. And those are my introductory comments. Um, and I look forward to discussing and taking questions. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Uh, briefly, I'm going to um, try not to sound like an expert for my five minutes, but I found uh, a few areas of your website of interest, and I was going to share some of that material with our audience. First, the, um, I encourage people to take a look at the Kazarian Foundation's Citizens Wealth Glossary section of their website. I appreciate the, um, the framework, the Citizens Wealth Framework, both analytically as well as how it frames the issues that we're going to be talking about today. Um, it frames the issues in terms of the wealth of the citizens, not the government. It's not talking about the means to the end. The government is not the end. It's the means to the end. Citizens are, are and the sovereign uh, wealth of the country that resides in the, the sovereign, we the people. Um, so briefly, and in fact, Paul just, uh, I'm going to share some sentences from that citizens wealth glossary with you that in fact, Paul just said, but it's worth repeating, quote, the debt and cash deficit framework is both chronically flawed and massively value destructive, in part because it enables corruption and mismanagement. Cash-based fiscal balances provide vastly more flexibility to create fiscal illusions than do numbers calculated in accordance with international accounting standards. And in turn, citizens' wealth, quote, can expo expose touted claims of economic prosperity that in reality is financial destruction resulting from hidden increases in government financial burden put on the citizenry. Um, and in turn, I encourage people to take a look at the Columbia Business School's evaluation comparison of their citizens' wealth framework. The second uh, item on your website I thought was kind of fun to read was the um, 
an English translation of an article in a German publication in 2018. The uh, translation of the title of the article was, if a CEO were to keep his books like a politician, he would be in prison with the following um, items in that, in that article. Quote, public accounting is fraught with arbitrariness, not only in Greece, but throughout Europe, indeed worldwide. The Kazarian Foundation wants to get countries to give citizens a sense of how well politicians manage their land. In other words, politics should finally learn business administration. Public accounting allows politicians to disguise the costs of their decisions simply by pushing them into the future. Quoting Kazarian, he said, they promise social benefits and the next government will have to pay, criticized Kazarian. In the case of accounting, according to international standards, the cost of such decisions would be accounted for immediately and thus immediately visible. And then in turn, another quote, uh, for a while, he had the fun of collecting tricks of government accounting, but he stopped collecting them because there were just too many. <laughs> um, the next global crisis, he said, and this is more um, of a warning sign why we're in a, actually a serious, not fun topic today. Quote, the next global crisis will not be unleashed by a private bank as in Lehman Brothers, quote, it will emanate from a state, he says, something to be concerned about. And then finally, briefly, a, a 2016 article in The Accountant included the following, the following observation. He gave a speech when he accepted the William Pitt the Younger Award, Mr. Kazarian did. Um, here's, here's what it included. If Western democracy is going to survive populist assault, governments must regain the trust and confidence of voters. With better financial transparency, performance, and accountability, governments must accept the responsibility to educate current and prospective voters on the importance of internationally comparable government financial statements, especially the government's decision and the impact on the government balance sheet. Um, interest, they're focused on balance sheets. We appreciate that at Truth and Accounting. So, Paul, I guess briefly, I have uh, uh, several questions before we get to the audience. Hope that hope my introduction some ideas out there for you. Um, but first, I guess I'd like to step back and, you know, your, your educational background before your MBA, Paul, you had um, undergraduate and graduate uh, studies focused more on political science and government. My question for you is, um, did you have any inspirational teachers at that time? And what, when did you first start getting stoked about finance in general and government finance specifically? Yeah, I was, I was very fortunate to have uh, two great thesis advisors, because I wrote two, and both of them, one was at Bates College, his name was John Simon, he was actually a brilliant uh, understander of political theory. And he was very well versed in not only European and Greek uh, political theorists, but the US. Um, and that's when we first were exposed to people like Thomas Paine, for example, and I found that you know to be amazingly. I, I recall to this day his book on common sense, and the introduction, uh, and, and it provides inspiration, you know, to us on how difficult you know work needs to be and the role of government and the the aspect of government. And then at Brown, I had a, a fabulous um, a thesis advisor by the name of Enver, El, Elmer Cornwell, who is a legend, uh, and, and Brown. And the, the, the understanding of the workings of government were just, I was very fortunate. I mean, I, I didn't know I'd end up moving into finance. That wasn't the expectation. Um, it was to, at Brown, it was to get my PhD in, in, in political theory. That's not where, where it, the direction it took, but that provided, you know, and public choice, you know, Dennis Mueller's book, we, that had just come out. Uh, you know, when I was at Brown. And so the, the whole development and the evolution, you know, uh, from Locke to Rousseau, to Paine, to Jefferson, I mean, it, it was a European, you know, US and of course, you know, the Greek philosophers, but that, that's my, ba that, that was my background. That's changed. It's fun, to, it's fun to learn about your appreciation for Thomas Paine, those first two paragraphs and common sense in the introduction set the stage for some important ideas that are relevant today, sadly. Um, second, I guess I, in, in your recent debate at, at Columbia Business School, you held up a book, The Reckoning. Could you talk about that book and, and why you kind of recommended it? 
Yeah, it's a book by Professor Jacob Soul. And the, the interest of that, in fact, was an epiphany, was that he had gone back uh, far, back to the 1350s, into Genoa, Italy. And he really broke the response that we heard from so many of the economists over the past seven years, because we were one of the, I guess, the largest owner of Greek government bonds in certain categories um, at the time. And the response we got from so many people was that governments you know, do not have double entry accounting, they don't keep books, they don't have balance sheets, they can't have net worth. And it's almost a reflex reaction by so many of the, the economists. And he did a great job chronicling that the, 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 actually the, 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 the establishment of the balance sheet was at the government level. It didn't emanate from business. And you'll office, often hear reactions from the economists in particular that, well, this is a business concept. And, 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 and Professor Sowell was, did an excellent job saying, no, this came from government. You know, it came from Colbert. It came from Hamilton. It went back to Genoa. And he, and he really does, and he just takes that and just says no, and he, and he chronicles, and he does an excellent job, and then he ties it with financial accountability and the rise and fall of nations. And recently, his, his book was translated by the Chinese government. And if you check the Beijing Municipal website, they're recommending the translated version of his book to, to the members of government and the population because they know that that's the underbelly of a capitalist you know, kind of liberal democracy, it's financial illiteracy and financial recklessness. Well, along, along the lines of perhaps reckless, recklessness, um, you know, we titled our, our discussion today, Deficits Do Matter. What deficits matter, Paul, or how do you count deficits? What, you have some concerns, I guess, about cash-based accounting as it leads to reported deficits versus real deficits? What, what's going on there? You know, I'll, because I assume your audience is mostly, you know, U.S. focused. Um, I'll, I'll keep my comments more there than, you know, in Europe or Asia, uh, which is where we spend a lot of time. Um, the debt or the deficit, it's, it, it's almost, it's, it's a toxic obsession with a number that is massively easy to manipulate and create fiscal illusions or creative accounting. The, the, the number can be distorted in so many different ways. I mean, and, and, and there's this obsession and, and, and the ignorance that they shouldn't use the full government balance sheet. You know, in the UK, for example, where they have whole of government accountings, debt's only 20% of their balance sheet, 20%. And, but yet the focus is on debt and the deficit for the US has for the last 20 years only been about 66% of the actual losses done on a financial statement to reflect economic reality. So this obsession with debt and this obsession with deficit, it's gonna be very hard to change. But when, I, when, when you sit down and you have you know, a debate with an economist, they understand how much they're missing in the balance sheet and how easy that number is for, for, for fiscal illusion creative counting. I mean, governments keep two sets of books, like the US, they keep their financial statements, and then they have this basic, you know, kind of political construct that doesn't reflect economic reality at all, which is a cash deficit. And so both of those really should just be thrown out the window, and they need to focus on the total balance sheet and financial information that reflects financial reality and isn't, it, it, it isn't really cooking the books to present a distorted view of the financial reality. Yeah, Paul, um, Bill, I'll chime in uh, there. Um, Paul, we find that you know California is a good example. Before this crisis, um, the governor uh, was touting a surplus, um, but we find that they had the most. If you look at a balance sheet, they had the most debt, um, or you know, the worst by overall financial condition, even though he was telling his citizens that he had a surplus. No, there's a chronic, man, the, 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 the US financial statements that are audited, I mean, for 25 years in a row, they haven't been able to get a clean opinion. And, and this is the world's you know, leader 
and you know, country that had been you know very highly respected, on, you know, and, and they can't get a clean audit opinion, and people don't use the financial statements, they don't look at them. They they they're still including or excluding 2.8 trillion of debt held by Social Security from their balance sheet, which is absolutely contrary to international accounting standards. You know, it's, it's one thing, and I, and I know you focus on it, which is Social Security, but that's, you know, a, a trap in a way for the economists, because then once they mention that, then they start talking about clean air, clean water, and just really trying to come up with any other concept they can. Um, but when you stick with the balance sheet and the financial statements, which are audited, there's a, you can identify fiscal illusion. You know, it, it, it's interesting with the, the U.S., we, we were surprised to learn that 17% of its property, plant, and equipment is impaired in their own footnotes and yeah. not taken as an impairment to net worth. This is horrible, horrible, reckless financial accounting, and it's being tolerated. Yeah, when I first read the uh, federal government's financial statements, I was astounded when I Bill, did you have another question? Yeah, I guess I have one last one. Now we can go to the, the audience. But in your recent debate at Columbia, you identified a few quote misconceptions unquote, and one of them at, along the lines of your concerns about the uh, failure to secure a clean audit in the United States. One of your misconceptions was that the U.S. serves as a, a global benchmark for, for financial management. Are we overconfident in the United States and its finances in the United States? I'll make two, Bill Bush, have two comments in that regard. One, the U.S. government still does not have a whole of government financial statements. They have federals, they have states, they have cities, which, which, which are, you know, have, 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 have a lot of problems with them, but they haven't yet even produced a whole of government financial statement. We've worked on it. And the numbers are absolutely, you know, when you combine the accounting, so that that's one. And if you don't publish financial statements, it's hard to be taken as a world leader when you don't look at the full government, especially given the order of magnitude on an internationally comparable audited basis. That's one. The second point is when you look at the New Zealand model, <clears throat> excuse me, which is clearly the best in the world and run with real financial statements, real net worth, I mean, they understand and they don't have two sets of books. They have one set of books. And you look at citizens' wealth or you look at the comparison with total government net worths. Since 2000, over the past you know, 19 years, U.S. citizens' wealth per citizen, again, this is simple, GDP less the government's total negative net worth, simple, from their balance sheet and GDP used, the U.S. government per citizen is down 25,000, New Zealand's up 44,000. And on total net worth, again, directly from their financial statements, the U.S. is down 53,000 per person, New Zealand's up 18. And as a percentage of GDP, the U.S. is down 53 percentage points versus New Zealand up 37. These are critical numbers. They're not being discussed. And relative to the debt and deficit model, you know, we had one. Uh, we, we 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 have a library, you know, in the foundation, and they literally have maybe a hundred plus books and thousands of articles, all focused on debt and deficit, debt and deficit. You won't find one discussing the total government balance sheet, even if they use the term balance sheet. It's selective, and basically exists of cherry picking. This is to understand the government, and the U.S. needs to be a leader in this regard, because you know, since 2008 in particular, and with Japan since 2000, you've had basically unstinted financial spending. And each crisis that comes in is like another massive elevator drop in the financial position of the governments. And to think that we're not gonna have another financial crisis in the next five to seven years is just unrealistic. And each time this notion of the big bazooka being brought out regardless of the country just having unstinted financial recklessness. The U.S. has to be a leader. And right now, 
it's way down the bottom. And that's very disappointing. Yeah, it is. Uh, let me get to uh, some audience questions. Uh, thanks everybody for joining uh, the Truth in Accounting Ask the Experts webinar. Um, there will be a, that we are taping this. So if you uh, wanna listen again or, or uh, send the link to your friends, feel free. Um, our first audience question is, is it true that cash basis deficits narrative can create fiscal illusions? However, there is also a risk of window dressing to present artificially distorted information of the government's balance sheet on an accrual basis of the whole government. How do you bridge that gap and keep the credibility of the government's financial statements? I can go ahead with that if you want. Yes. Yeah, from, from, from an analytical point of view, having the financial statements is your starting point. Then your job, as an analyst assessing risk as we do, which is sovereign risk or management, is you need to go and then clean, basically take out the fiscal illusion or window dressing. It absolutely exists. But what the financial statements provide, which statistics do not provide, is they provide the material in the financial statements so that you as a rigorous analyst can go and make those financial statements based for reflect financial reality. So absolutely, you have to be aware that you cannot. And when you take the US government's you know, financial statements and you start with page 59, which is its balance sheet, and you're dealing with you know, uh, a document that's 300 pages long, you at least have it to work with. Statistics are a completely different animal. It's the number, it's an estimate that's often based on algorithms of flows. It, 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 they couldn't be any more different in integrity. So cash deficits are absolutely worthless. They're unproductive. The financial statements, even if they're subject to you know, fiscal illusion, you as a good analyst have the information, especially with the audit letter, to, to basically clean them up and make them more meaningful. Yeah, and then the second question is, um, can you, is it valuable to compare uh, the US to Japan? Yes, it is absolutely. We we have uh, we we've done that um, because the Japan is story is often used as justification for zero to negative interest rates, and it starts by saying, "Well, Japan's in, uh, debt is you know two hundred thirty seven or two hundred forty percent of GDP." First of all, the number's wrong. It's just it, it's patently wrong, and it's wrong on a level that starts that. Their debt is, unlike the rest of the world, is stated at market value, not nominal value. Now that's technical, but you just go down a list and the number is actually, when you take out the financial assets and proper consolidation, the number's you know, below 100%. So, that's, so, so it isn't this example that we can add more debt in the US because Japan's not, they're not that high. But we're the, we're, we're, you have to add the other side of that coin, which is, if you look at their citizens wealth, they have generated for each decline in their net worth, only about five cents of GDP. That's that 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 is massive cost they have there's the zero interest rates and negative interest rates really zero in Japan have been unbelievably valued destructive for the people and they're not a role model and either excess debt or the way to manage their economy. So on both fronts, when you really look at the numbers and take them carefully, you see a much different picture than often paid, uh, almost always paid, portrayed on Japan. Thank you. Um, next question is, if heads of governments are to take well-informed fiscal decisions, economists and accountants needs to synergize. However, professional streams remain narrowly focused? How do we bring them together? You know, one of the suggestions we, you know, we're, we're gonna make here is that we believe public debate is absolutely essential with the economists and with public financial management professionals. And what we're going to do as far as the foundation, it, get, getting the public financial management people involved is, is very easy. They're super public minded. 
the economists often are driven by much more, you know, kind of obvious political motivations of appointments. And what we're going to do is the foundation is going to offer cash stipends to them or donated to their favorite charities of twice whatever their speaking rate is to come and debate, you know, competent public financial uh, financial management experts, you know, online virtually, and to give them no excuse to hide from having to debate and organized an organized debate will double their rate of daily hourly payment that they're currently getting. So there really is no excuse for them to hide from a discussion of their flawed debt, you know, their destructive and really toxic debt and deficit, you know, discussion. And we'll donate to the charity if they don't want it. But that's one that, you know, we're making here and the foundation is going to stand behind that. And that's open to, you know, any economist of name. And I think that's a damn good, excuse me, a, a, yeah, a damn good start to kind of get them and get the sunshine shining on a lot on, on their flawed, you know, destructively toxic debt and deficit model. I, I think that's a great question. The importance of having economists and accountants talking to one another and uh, at least getting a, a discussion going in order to come to a grips with some of these difficult problems. Bank capital regulation is another area where in fact, you know, accountants are in their silo and economists are in their silo and the regulators are working with both parties. And there's some good work out there about the importance of getting economists and accountants together on bank capital regulation. Maybe we need the same sort of uh, emphasis in, in government accounting itself. Well, Bill, you're an economist and uh, I'm an accountant and we work fine in our office together. <laughs> At least publicly. <laughs> You know, I, I, th I think when, when, when you look at the discussion and the comments, the economists have political aspirations, and that's clear. You know, whether it's the Obama in, uh, uh, you know, administration or in Brussels, these are positions that are highly sought after, and they have economic teams, they have financial discipline or management teams. These are highly sought after political positions by the economist who basically can provide someone air cover. And you have to understand that there's natural defenses here, that you are basically, as a financial manager or an accountant, you are unwelcomed because you're challenging their political or professional aspirations. And it's very naive to think that they're coming at it with you know, a, an open mind, fair perspective. They're not. They want to be the next chief economic advisor to the president. That's a goal. They want to be on their economics team, whether it's here in Europe. These are very valuable sought after provisions, positions. And you have to understand that this isn't, you know, a level, easy, you know, discussion of neutrality. They're heavily vested and very biased. I may be a garage economist, but I'm also very respectful of the importance of accounting in general, what the numbers are, where do they come from, and what are we using in our model. Um, accounting is the language of business, they say, and maybe we need to make it the language of government too. No, the balance sheet starts. The balance sheet, your net worth, this is the bedrock finance done on an internationally comparable basis where financial reality is the, the, the goal not distorted fiscal manipulation. We found when we first heard the term creative accounting when we, and the government sector, we of course associate that with cooking the books and going to jail uh, with public companies. In the public sector, you get rewarded and, they have, and they're brazen with the use of the term creative accounting. And that is something they wanna manipulate, distort. You know, much like you read, if you remember Dennis Mueller's book, you know, in some of the hypotheses you talked about in there, it's real. You get rewarded if you can get around the rules, whether they're public-private partnerships, whether they're concessions, whether it's the state and you know local level in the U.S. or the 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 the, the cameralistic accounting, you know, in Europe. Understand that they are rewarded for providing distorted, misleading financials, and that's just reality. Well, what is your opinion, uh, Mr. Kazarian, on uh, the role of a central bank? Does a central bank, uh, one, give an unlimited mon monopoly power over the banking system and fiat money slash credit interest, give a sovereign perver um, perverse incentive to issue 
seemingly unlimited debt and then currency uh, debasement because there is no com competition or backstop? Um, what is a, your take on the fractional reserve bank banking and should it be better regulated and explained to the consumers? You know, to take it on an international perspective for a minute, you know, kind of pull back from the US Fed. Step number one is that the central banks have balance sheets like any other entity. And that needs to be consolidated in the whole of government balance sheet on a proper basis so people can understand the consequences of the central bank's actions. That is step number one. New Zealand does it, the UK does it. You need to integrate the central bank. Otherwise you're, you're driving the plane with no controls. That's number one. Two, having central banks print money via a, a countless number of schemes to try to camouflage it is no different anywhere in the world, whether it's Argentina, Lebanon, you pick the, you know, the US and the major economies, you know, whether it's the ECB or the Fed, there's nothing innovative here. You're know, coming up with schemes to print more money is no different. The only difference is they're crushed because they currently don't, you know, they don't have a reserve currency and the US is in a position and the major economies are where they haven't had, you know, the, the, the consequences of inflation, but it starts with at least, at least consolidating the central banks into your government financials so you can see the consequences of their actions from a financial perspective. And if they're overly printing the numbers and the magnitude becomes, you know, saying that we don't currently have inflation doesn't mean we're not going to have inflation. It doesn't mean inflation isn't currently misstated doesn't mean any of that. And I, we were recently in a debate, someone said, you don't have to worry about inflation because we don't have it. And I said, yeah, you, you, you don't have it till you have it. Like any other binge. And right now it's clearly a financial binge and it has been since 2008, at least in the US and Europe. And no, you got to consolidate it. That's just step number one. If you don't have your numbers, you don't know what you're doing. In, in, in thinking about consolidating the central bank with the overall government balance sheet, in the United States anyway, an accounting issue is worthy of, of stressing and bringing up here is where do the accounting standards for central banks come from? In the United States, we have the federal government driven by accounting standards that are developed by the Federal Accounting Standards Advisory Board. However, the next question you have to ask is where are the accounting standards developed for the Federal Reserve? And the answer is, the answer to the trivia question, who, who, who creates the accounting standards for the Federal Reserve? The answer is the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve makes its own accounting standards and changes them when they see fit, which is um, a different standard than the, the federal government's accounting standards. And consolidation would have to deal with uh, ironing out those differences. No, Bill, you're right. I mean, basically you have the Fox you know, guarding the, you know, the, 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 the chicken or the hen house. And that, that's what it is. And, and you don't want to be, you know, overly critical because that's not the, 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 the objective of moving forward. But you have to be realistic and understand whether it's central banks or the level of fiscal manipulation. This is reality. And you can't let them set their own standards. And when the U.S. government's had 25 years without a clean audit opinion, it's kind of like having, you know, just sitting there and saying, you can't get, if you read the U.S. government audit letter going back, I know David Walker, I, I think is on your board. Um, and you go back even further. It just go every year, it's the same. And the central banks set their own standard. They continue to put the 2.8 trillion, you know, take it out and net it out on their debt in the U.S., but they don't take the liabilities of the social security. So if you think about it, you're going to consolidate an entity eliminate the 2.8 trillion of debt that's held by social security, but not take the liabilities. It's like taking half the balance sheet. Yep. I mean, it's ridiculous. I recently had a, a student ask me for a letter of reference and he brought up the paper assignment that I gave the student to read the GAO audit opinion letter going back to the last couple of decades and summarize the results. There aren't too many people in America that realize that the, uh, the federal government has not has received a disclaimer of opinion on its own financial statements for 20 years. It's, it's, not a, it's not a healthy situation. 
Um, the next question from the audience, gentlemen, is uh, when will we start to see the U.S. government debt, I assume interest rate, go up significant because of our debt? You know, the, 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 the first thing is, is the focus shouldn't be on the debt. And I know that's going to be very hard for people to change because it's been ingrained in them, you know, for so long when the government started, they were very small. You know, and if you look at the UK, for example, the, the, the growth of the government has been, I think, four times their balance sheet GDP, four times since, since you know, and so that it, it's now, you know, I'm looking at it right here, it's 307% of their economy and it's grown by 4.1 times. Everything's changed and the change in focus on the debt, it really needs to be on the negative net worth or the total burden, whichever way you wanna look at it. And the consequences for interest rates, you know, it clearly is not good. I mean, there's no way. I mean, when, you, when, when you're in, in, in the end of a binge, stage that the binge and you look at Japan to bring back, you know, their rates and you look at it, you look at the destruction that's occurred and what, from our investment point of view, you look at and you say, how disbelieving or unknowledgeable is the market? And, you know, over the seven years, we met with basically every, 11 out of the to 12 major sovereign wealth funds. And it was so clear that they had nowhere understanding of government financial statements. And when they did, it was like this light bulb that went on their head. This will happen. This will happen. Debt has become a smaller portion. The balance sheet, the non-financial debts are a, a multiple of the financial debts and the deterioration of the financial assets. If you look at your infrastructure, they not only should be impaired, but they should be a liability that should be put on their books to give real financial reality. And that's all gonna cascade into interest rates. I mean, it can't, I mean, it's financially reckless. And that's what you have. Predicting, predicting market interest rates is not easy in part because crowd psychology is involved. How, how, how often is the crowd right? Currently the crowd believes that interest rates are, 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 should be low and government bond prices should be high. What if the crowd changes its mind? What if we, you know, when does the when does that tipping point come? I can't predict it, but I'm concerned, like Paul is, that the, the fundamentals driving the equation are not not favorable. No, and when you talk about you know printing more money, it, you go back and you say, okay, so what about your non-financial assets? What are you doing? What about your financial assets? What about your non-financial liabilities? These are real numbers, and in many cases, they're eighty percent of the balance sheet. And you have you know, your financial managers for your governments literally focusing on tools that you, they, they can basically make up. It's, 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 it, it clearly is, has all the makings of a massive financial binge and a massive financial binge is gonna be counterweighted with a match, massive financial bust. And it's just, it has, so you can go back you know, thousands of years, binges leads to busts. And, that, and there's going to be another crisis, and just look at the numbers. Um, is there, um, there's a disconnect um, between sound financial management and government conduct um, is simply politics. What can we do to persuade political leaders to behave more responsible with respect to financial decisions and financial management? You know, when you look at the New Zealand model, they talk about clearly that if they didn't have the cross political support for fiscal responsibility and sound management, nothing would have happened. I think Bill can talk about Utah possibly uh, because he's, you know, he has that perspective, which, which I don't. But what you can do, and I think what we can do, you know, we look at very personally, is we need to engage the so called you know, rock star economists to expose this charade you know, which, which is really what it is with the debt that, you know, this massively devastatingly toxic debt and deficit model, you need to first expose that for what it is. And they need to be, you know, put in a position where they, where they have to have to change for, by educating the public. And, and that's, you know, whether it's like Thomas Paine's pamphlet back at the time of the American revolution, it starts with that same, you know, they talk about if it hadn't been for Payne's book and Washington's sword, the US 
you know, wouldn't have been able to move forward in 1776. You need to have this level of dialogue. There needs to be pamphlets. And it's going to be extraordinarily hard because so such large percentages of Europe, the US, Latin America, you know, have basically no savings. And they become massively every year more fiscally reckless. And they're following the role models of government, which are fiscally reckless. So you start with the debate, you go right to the heart, which are the ones who supposedly are the, you know, the oracles of Delphi, the economists, the all seeing and the all knowing on topics. And you engage them in public debate and let the public see where the direction goes. Along the lines of New Zealand providing good lessons, um, the United States also has some good lessons available. And that some of the states are, are run very responsibly like Utah and, and others that have a good track record of actually truly balancing their budget in the sense that the, uh, the accrual accounting based results consistently have revenue in line with or a little ahead of expenses on an accrual basis. Uh, unfortunately, some of our larger states are not in that category. Um, Paul, can you tell us more about uh, the citizen's wealth and why it's important? Yeah. Um, you know, the, the two parts, the one I think we've covered hopefully is all the flaws, we call them the seven Fs of the broken, you know, destructive debt and deficit models, right? That could is, is this part. And I think we've covered that. There's a lot more you discussed, but why citizens' wealth? The notion that you have growth, and this goes back, you know, I, I started at Goldman Sachs, which is an investment bank. Um, it was smaller at that time, it was a partnership. And one of the reasons I had moved up in the firm was I came up with these indicators that married together stocks and flows in ways people didn't see. And that's how it was the basic, the founding of Japonica and our investments in Greece. And it's by taking, we were trying to find financial productivity and we took the revenue, which is basically your GDP and, 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 and the public sector. And we took the net worth of the companies to see what the price they were paying for this revenue growth was. And you apply that to the public sector and you use GDP, which is your flow, same as a revenue flow in the private sector. And then you counterweight that or subtract it, not as a ratio, but subtract it from the stock change, which is your total government net worth. That then gives the very unique insight into the cost of the growth, the relative relationship of the growth historically and with comparable. So if you think about it that way, because many people may be more familiar with it from a business or commercial point of view, if you take it, you transition it to GDP as the flow and total government net worth, which they clearly do have a net worth as your cost, and you subtract the two, that gives you the ability to either do second derivatives, do multipliers, to understand comparatively what price are they getting. And that's where Japan came in. And you saw that they were only getting like five cents for each decline in their total government net worth. That's the rationale behind the ratio. And it was super helpful, you know, when we had our, our Greek bond investment, because it allowed us to highlight, you know, there, because we had to build a balance sheet, you know, for Greece with a team of over a hundred people. And that was part of the, 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 the understanding of their relative position. So, you know, if you go to the website, you know, um, and not to talk about the website, but there's a great glossary there and it talks about the rationale, the comparative advantages. And if you take the time, you'll really see, you know, I think which is like the brilliance, you know, of citizens wealth to really get at the heart of, you know, the price of growth. Well, um, you've seen our data Z and Bill, maybe you might be able to help Paul with this answer. Um, do we have enough information about the the um, the states and the local governments um, in in our data Z to actually calculate a citizen's wealth for each of the fifty states and for um, each of the cities? I mean, you do, and I was something I was going to raise with you offline, but I think you know to build a, a government whole a government balance sheet based on proper financial you know accounting. You can get very close. It takes a little extra work. And of course, our foundation would support this. But yes, you can do it. Yes, you can compare them. And the focus kind of moving away from debt 
and move, which is just you know an absolute arcane, obsolete concept, and moving it to total government net worth, you'll find that that really is a better understanding. And then you pull it with the with the GDP, which is you know the universally used and probably by default, even though it's not great, and you have to adjust it in the cases of Ireland and others. Um, but it's it, it is a good proxy to really highlight the city. What is what are the government as stewards? for their assets doing to, and that's the focus of the balance sheet. That's the focus of citizens' wealth. It's like, look, the governments have in many cases, 300% of GDP is balance sheet of assets and debts under their, under their stewardship. They need to be held accountable in one case. And two, they also need to understand it to better manage it. So whether you're China in that case or Singapore in that case or others, they have they have the understanding that this is the only way they can really optimize their government's stewardship of the assets and liabilities is to use the most basic tool of a balance sheet and net worth. And I think part of the obstacles is it's just so difficult for an economist who loves you know complex algorithmic models and calculus to believe that our basic properly prepared financial statement and net worth can really be so effective and managing financial performance. They just, they cannot get over it. So yes, I think you could, and we'd love to work with you, you know, on, on that. We'd love to work with you too, for sure. Uh, one challenge going forward is taking the, um, those, those financial statements at face value can be problematic. One issue underneath, especially for state and local governments, has to do with deferred maintenance costs for infrastructure how well do we know what uh, the states are grappling with in that area? It's a difficult number to quantify. It's a cautionary note in using the numbers we could come up with, but it's, it's out there. At the, federal level, at the federal level, you have it, which is kind of helpful. If you go to, it's very interesting, you go to page 207 of the US, <laughs> I, I just think it's helpful to do this. As you go, they actually have a breakout of deferred maintenance. Now, interestingly, it's less than they had when Walker was there. They used to have high, low, and critical, which was much more insightful on trends. Again, this is financial statements, and you can understand from a financial manager, and they've little by little culled it back. You know, you can do analyses, it won't be perfect, but if you use the audited financials and principles, and, start with that. and you build up, because there's nothing now. The U.S. government does not have a whole of government financial statements. It's just it's a, a, a unbelievable in a way that such a, a beacon of freedom and leadership doesn't even produce a financial statement on a whole of government basis. It's, it friend, really is. It's unbelievable. A friend, a friend of our organization is a fellow named Joseph Marin who has an argument that the Federal Reserve should be consolidated in light of the Statement and Account Clause of the United States Constitution which calls for, quote, all public money to be part of a statement and account. And, and if that's true, where is the Federal Reserve in, the, in that report you just held up for our, for our listeners? It's nowhere. You have to go get its own. And he's 100% right. And it's just another example of, you know, the government and these financial statements not adhering to what they need to do. And they need to be held accountable. And it's in their own interest. And uh, to uh, help people understand this at an individual level, um, and to use New Zealand as an example, um, how would an individual citizen benefit from, how does an individual citizen in New Zealand benefit from a um, strong balance sheet? And how would somebody, in, uh, if we had a stronger balance sheet, how would that help in each citizen? Uh, the, the, the benefits for the citizens, if you look at them, it, 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 it starts with you know, equality financially. And what you see in, in New Zealand is that, that their rankings on the social sectors for social equality, for economic prosperity, you know, the, uh, the Legatum Index, they're consistently, consistently rated security one, two, or three. It's not a coincidence. And they'll see it in every aspect of their life. And I think, you know, as importantly, when they run their own finances, and everybody has to run their own budget, they have to run their household budget, their personal budget. When you have a financially unstinted 
government at the federal level, unstinted, reckless, that's the role model that they set for their public and it just cascades down and you end up getting larger and larger percentages of your public that don't understand savings, don't understand how to manage their own position and the trauma that occurs in a family or an individual's life who basically becomes in many cases indentured servers of financial institutions who are burdening them with debt. You know, I, I think you know, part of going back to political you know, education is that the you know, financial credit institutions will stuff you with debt until you pop. That is, that is a horrible part of a capitalistic society, but it happens. They will continue to stuff more debt down your throat in an avaristic fashion until you explode. That is part of the capitalist system. And when your government is financially reckless and unstinted with its spending, and there's a lot of you know, supplicants and, uh, of, of you know, more and more and more, it just trickles down where people become basically indentured servants and that just wrecks their lives. It creates more social dissension, problems at home, you know, problems in the street, inequality, just ripples through. And it's just, it's a very sorry, sorry comment, you know, outside of it from, uh, you know, a strict financial perspective, but you can see the consequences. That's, you know, Bill. I'm getting depressed again, Sheila. A private joke. When we, when we consider these topics, Sheila and I, every once in a while, kind of start shaking our head. And I'm, I'm, I'm sad that you just stated some important truths about the implications of, of, the, of the downward spiral. And, and we're, you know, we need to turn it around. Yeah, and I, and I, I was noticed on uh, your, uh, what we talked about, your foundation, you mentioned in addition to public financial management, you mentioned financial literacy. And I think that, is, is that what you're talking about? Uh, and is that what you guys work on is individual financial literacy? Yeah, it, it goes across the spectrum from economists to the government officials, to individuals, to any stakeholder. And the financial literacy, just to distinguish it from, this is not investment banking financial literacy where we're teaching people to gamble with the stock market. That is not what the financial literacy is. And I've seen so many of these financial literacy courses that are backed by financial institutions that are getting to put on more debt and more speculation. Our financial literacy work is to get them to use proper balance sheet to understand their position in their life, whether it's buying a new car versus a used car, what are the consequences to their own net worth and their balance sheet? This gives them the bedrock to their finances. And that really provides a, a much higher probability of the stability to their both their, their, their social well-being and their mental stability. I mean, it, it's that basic and it's that fundamental that when you have you know, reckless financial leadership at the government level, it trails down to the business level and then the individual level. And then they start competing for who can add more debt and become more speculative and reckless. It's not, it, it, it's a very sorry comment. And when you talk about interest rates and you see where it is, you, you know, predicting the exact timing, but what you do know is the worse the swing to one end, the bigger the swing is gonna be to the next end. Hmm. And right now it is massively reckless. In, in, at state and local governments, accounting standards for funds accounting actually um, reinforce or incentivize this proclivity towards debt. Borrowing proceeds and anticipated borrowing proceeds can actually be thought of as revenue for the purposes of your surplus. And as a consequence, you know, I still remember asking a member of the finance committee of the Chicago City Council, how can you claim to balance the budget every year when your accrual expenses are, are above your revenue by a a, a billion dollars a year. He was almost proud. He said, well, we borrow money and, and that's, how, that's, that's how we get money in the door. Well, when well, they sell the gentlemen, that's all the time we have. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us, Paul and, and Bill. Thank you for your insights. Um, we're thrilled that our audience members were able to join you, join us. Um, so thank you for listening. Um, we are, have another, um, Ask the Experts um, plan for August, 20, August 25th. Um, so join us then, and you can also uh, get this on uh, 
a YouTube version of this on our website or on Facebook. So thanks again for joining us. Thanks again for Paul. We, uh, Truth and Accounting looks forward to working with your foundation and just trying to bring financial literacy to the elected officials, the government officials and individual citizens. And thank you for my team, especially Courtney for putting this together. Everybody have a great day. You too, good work, excellent work, keep it up. Great to be with you, Paul. Mm -hmm.